Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Monday live stream. And uh, just like we were talking about, I believe that there are catalysts to the next bull run. And specifically, there's four catalysts. And this is what I'm talking about. And actually, this was all spurned on by an article. Uh, this was from Cointelegraph. And it talks about how Rec Capital, they had put together some uh, some nice TA, some nice graphs. And they talk about how this Bitcoin is repeating 2016 history perfectly and there's a 350,000 price prediction. First of all, these are two of my most um, non-satisfactory types of uh, presentations that I like to give. First of all, anything with TA, and second of all, anything with the price prediction. I think the, I think the price predictions are worthless. The TA does have its place in it, but this is what we have. I'm gonna totally skip the price prediction because again, those are worthless. And let's just go into this. This was pretty good. Red Capital said, hey, Bitcoin has repeated a 2016 history perfectly offering a downside wick below the bottom of its current reaccumulation range within a three week window after the halving. And this was, you know, looking back at 2016. Now, the previous halving that we had was uh, around May 11th, May 12th, 2020, correct me in the comments section. Of course, we just had one on April 20th, 2024. And of course, we know that after that, around that halving time, we were in the 70, around 70K. And of course, now we're coming down to the 62, 60K level. And it's been a dip just like it was in 2016, but then it re-fired uh, up moving forward. And that got me thinking about, well, essentially where we're going. And it says here, Rect, highlight, Rect highlighted Bitcoin is currently in the last pre-halving retrace, which was a 48% a spike just six months later on December 30th to $973, which was pretty good. So again, it got me thinking about, well, if that was 2016, what this reminded me of was either, doesn't really matter about, about the Bitcoin halving, but it was what happens after the halving. There's always a catalyst. And when I took a look and I remember this, this is the same type of thing that we also saw in 2020. So again, we had a Bitcoin halving somewhere around May 12th, right? Around $9,000, $8,700. And it kind of, it took a little bit of a dip, but then it just kind of went sideways for a bit, which I really don't care about. This is the time I think to re, to start to accumulate again. If you haven't done so already, if you got kind of shook out, people talking about, hey, this is not gonna go, Bitcoin's going to zero, sure. But as we can see here in 2020, what happened? Well, there was some catalysts and it's the same catalyst again. What happened in 2020? Well, we had the coronavirus, right? And then things shut down and we had the M2 money supply uh, get get reignited with quantitative easing. We had a presidential election and we had a reallocation of funds. But there's something, one thing that's different from back then. Well, we can see that in September, everything was going good. And then November, of course, October, November, December, and we hit all time highs going into 2021. And I kind of feel like that's what we could be doing today because of these four catalysts. And this is what it really comes down to. So first of all, this was the one catalyst we didn't have back then. And back then we didn't have major institutions coming in. Sure, we had Elon Musk come out and say, hey, we're gonna allow you to buy our Teslas uh, using Bitcoin. And they also actually also put uh, Bitcoin on their, on their balance sheet, which was great and a nice piece, but we didn't have these ETFs, this, this ETF. We didn't have the institutions coming in and we didn't have what's called a 13F filing, which is, being broadcast today and actually the uh, the deadline is may 15th so this is what what's going on major institutions reveal significant stakes in blackrock uh the etf ahead of the 13f filing date here's what it is according to the latest 13f filings of course they also have they all have to do that with the sec and the irs symmetry investments has a 61 and a half million holding all right that's nice rubric capital 69.7 million and Bracebridge Capital, now the largest IBIT holder, which I had no idea who these people were, with over 100 million invested in shares. And I had to take a look at them like, well, who is Bracebridge Capital? Apparently it's a hedge fund, located in Boston. And they have, as far as asset center management, $12 billion. So if they're putting $100 million in, that's a, a pretty big piece, but just wait. They like to play the risk game and they like to play it well. So Bracebridge's position is offset by a complex set of options valued at over 270 million for the SEC filing. A mix of calls and puts were placed, creating a complex delta neutral combo that uh, combines elements of a strangle and a straddle with a bullish bias. It will profit mostly if IBIT stages a large rally, i.e. if the price of Bitcoin goes up and the ETFs of course go up. 
but the long puts provide some downside protection. I, got a, I have no problem with that. That's a pretty smart thing to do. And I think what was interesting also about this, this whole piece here was that BlackRock filed its 13F and revealed it only had a 6.6 .6 million stake in its own ETF. So kind of interesting. Let me know what you think about that in, in the comment section. So that was one of the catalysts, of course, the ETFs, the 13F filings, these major institutions. Remember, today's the 13th, so we got two more days before the actual deadline. We're going to see more institutions come out. We're going to see how much they've actually put into it. And again, as I've always said, it's a step in the right direction. So that's one catalyst. The next catalyst we had back in the day, and, and this has actually changed, is the M2 money supply. And if we take a look, and I'm stealing all this information from Ben's website because I love to steal. And what I did was I, I, we always overlay, and you can overlay whatever you want. You can do Bitcoin. Uh, you can do, let's see, indices, the S&P 500 index. Pretty much whatever you overlay, and going all the way back to the 1960s, as the money supply goes up, miraculously, the S&P 500 goes up. It's amazing that that works out. Of course, in these gray sections, we have what is known as a recession. However, the government wants to define that these days is fine. But going back to crypto, let's take Bitcoin again. Let me zoom in so people can see this. Going back to the very early days. We just see that, of course, it's great when we have more liquidity. And how do we get more liquidity? Well, the money printer goes brewer, right? Treasury comes out. Fed comes out and says, hey, you know what? We need, we need more money. And that's exactly what happens. Now we have peaks and valleys, of course, because things get overheated. And, you know, we've talked about this yesterday in yesterday's video, of course, why things go up, why things go down, and my five rules. But as you can see right here, this is the last time we just took a look at. Coronavirus, recession, very, very short recession, I might add, because money printer came on. Money printer came on, and what did the price do? It skyrocketed. And we can see as it goes up and up, there was a point though in April where things just went a little too crazy, crashed down again. Here's November or December. Well, ah, November is, I think it's the, it's the peak at 63. I think it was 67. But then we can see a plateau here as people started to sell off, sell off, sell off. And what's interesting in this piece is that you notice that quantitative easing turned into quantitative tightening. That means that the money printer was shut off for quite some time, but yet you can see here, as it came down to its last point, it was actually right around here, wasn't it? The blue line is Bitcoin. The red line is the M2 money supply. What happened around January, December, December 2022, January 2023, that's when we bottomed out. I think Bitcoin was around, I want to say 17,700. And then the money printer got, gets shut off and we, we go sideways for a bit. But isn't it an odd thing? This is, the, this is one of the first times this has actually happened. I mean, to a point where you've been pretty much stagnant on this money supply. And what does Bitcoin's price do? Just gone up. And it's one of those catalysts because of the thing we just talked about, ETF and 13F filings and big institutions coming in. So that's the second one. And the third thing, just like we had in 2020, we had a presidential election. Funny enough, we have the same people battling. And I'm not gonna go into this big time because nobody likes talking about politics, but I will say it's the same thing. It's the same thing going on again. Markets do not like uncertainty. They don't like the uncertainty of pre-wars. But it's a funny thing. Once you get past presidential elections, which are essentially a war, or real wars getting into it, then all of a sudden the market's like, oh, okay, that's okay. So look on the bright side. I know somebody hates somebody in this picture. I can guarantee it. I can feel their seething hatred go to either Biden or Trump, maybe RFK Jr. Who hates RFK Jr.? I don't know. Worms. But in all honesty, let's just let's just say like this. If Biden gets gets reelected, of course, the world's not going to end. OK, this is not going to end. And then you can just look at it and go, well, at least the markets are going to you know, settle down. They're going to say, OK, we got Biden for four more years. Let's see how that works out. And then you just move, move forward. And then, of course, if you get RFK Jr., you're like, hey, that's that's crazy. This will be the first time a, a, a third party candidate actually won. Let's see what his his stances are. And he's pretty pro crypto. So that's good for us. And a couple of different other things that he's that he's on board with. Hey, it might be fantastic. And then of course, as everybody's booing, let's say Trump gets elected. Well, that sucks. But I mean, he's kind of warming up to crypto. And maybe in, in the future, if you say, well, you know, Trump won and I hate his guts. And of course, democracy and the whole world's gonna gonna end now. On the bright side, you can use all those gains in your crypto portfolio to move to Canada, wherever you want to go. So just look on the bright side. 
These are these different catalysts, which of course the presidency, M2 money supply, and the 13F filings for the ETF. And the last one as I talk about is reallocation. It's a funny thing, and I've made the same mistake. There is a lot of money sloshing around. Right now we have around $2.4 trillion in our entire crypto market cap. And when we take a look at this, this little square right here is 100 billion. I'm not gonna go over this whole thing since it's, it's, I've beaten this dead horse way too much. But I will just say like this, I don't know how the heck gold has almost 12 trillion market cap. I still don't get it. If you look at it, I mean, people, I mean, you know, some of the, the gold bugs, first of all, I own gold and silver as well. And they'll say, well, the intrinsic value and the intrinsic value, and it's great for microprocessors, blah, 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 blah. You know, 90% of what people use gold for is speculation. The other 10% is what they call the intrinsic value, even though the intrinsic value is whatever we, we, we hold value to be. So I guess. I don't see why we can't take one trillion away from that. I just don't get it. And then I'm not going to talk about this, but, but okay, look at this. The S&P 500. How many people are doing great in the... Uh, and just traditional equities, securities, stocks. That's 36 trillion. Can we peel away 1 trillion from that from people going, you know what, I don't like this game. And I don't really like what's going on. Maybe I should go, in, go into crypto a little more. I mean, just either half a trillion. Debt, not a big, the money supply we, always talk, we already talked about. More debt, look at that, that's a lot of debt. But then this part, and I think this is where, where we could really find a lot of people because this is this has been my conclusion you know on this channel i love talking about you know uh, my pleasure in buying real estate land that type of things short-term long-term rentals but in all honesty do you ever own it you don't ever own it it kind of sucks it kind of sucks because if you buy your house and you pay off your house today guess what you're never going to own it because you're still going to have to pay taxes on it and that goes on forever Forever. And that is even if you are a disabled veteran, in certain states, you do not have to pay your taxes. However, when it goes to your kids or your grandkids, guess who gets taxed? Well, that happens there. And then also when they take it over, they're going to get taxed uh, at some point. So you'll never really, you'll never, ever, ever own real estate. Not to say that it's, it's not a bad Investment, I think it's solid. I think it's great. It has fantastic returns. It's done, done for me really well, me and my wife over the decades. But 326 trillion, come on. We can't peel away 5 trillion out of that. And then of course, if we even go down farther, global wealth, yes, of course, I get it. Derivatives, I mean, come on, it's $600 trillion. We can't take away five or 10 trillion from there. So I just look at this and I go, why can't we peel away those funds for a reallocation? Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then also, just to give everybody a little bit of ray of sunshine, or not too much, ETFs are trying to net inflows following four weeks of outflows. Now, on this channel, I try to be a little bit balanced, not give you everything too, too pretty because it, it never goes up in a straight line. And this was a pretty good article, interesting. You know, I mean, just the title was great, but just know that the inflows total 116.8 million last week. And I was reading this, I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Until I got to the actual graph, I'm like, this is very underwhelming, I must tell you. So over here is looking pretty great, right? But in the last four weeks beforehand, we've had negative, 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 negative. And this little piece here is $116.8 million. So I guess it's going in the right direction, I'm very happy. If we take a look at heyapollo.com, uh, fantastic website to do all the, the tracking of the ETFs, just so you know, that uh, Grayscale Bitcoin is on the precipice of losing out to IBIT, which would be BlackRock, for the most amount of Bitcoin being held. In the beginning, it was 600,000 Bitcoin that was uh, held by Grayscale. And now it's down to 289. Uh, BlackRock is 275. And Michael's strategy, very close at 214,000. And of course, once that starts to get depleted, then we don't have so many outflows of what's going on. So I think that's good. I like to, to see that. And then also just a little uh, little interesting piece of news because we always kind of, sometimes I, I, I look a little bit too narrowly into today and I, do, I should really zoom out like I talk about. And this was, a, I think, a pretty good piece to talk about that, which was, this is a great, a great account over on uh, X called Look On Chain. And I, I linked their account in the description. And it's a pretty cool thing what they do. What they do is they essentially take a look at whale wallets or just 
because of course on-chain analysis you can you can do that but what you want to do is take a look at some of the bigger wallets that are out there and just pretty much track what they do and just kind of copy trade them and this is what look on chain does and it's a it's a really great piece i mean just you you take a look at it but uh one of the things they talked about here two wallets that have been dormant for almost 11 years bitcoin wallets transferred all their 1000 bitcoin out in the past 20 minutes so they haven't moved they've been dormant for almost 11 years and they just transferred out in 20 minutes wallet whatever this is received 500 bitcoin 62k at the time on september 13th 2013 when the price was get this 124 dollars we 124 bucks 500 bitcoin i mean back then it seems like a lot of money right and uh, of course you know what that how much that is worth yeah, that was worth, well, it's 60.9 for all 1,000 Bitcoins. That's roughly $30 million. Crazy in 10 years. Where can you do that? Can't do that. Wallet, the other one received 500 Bitcoin, 62K at that time, and the price is 124. So again, uh, follow that account. It's pretty interesting. Uh, they just said, like, this was from, this is what, what they had uh, uh, pierced on their on their timeline. How did I turn $1,000 on $30,000 with smart money? I found a smart money in Matic in June. Very good at buying lows and selling highs. I had this address to my watch list, and they just pretty much copied them. Boom, 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 boom. They bought over here. Blah, 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 blah. And it's the same thing uh, my man over at Smart Money Crypto does. He's been on the channel a couple of times. I also linked him in the description. What he does is the same type of thing. He finds these, these big wallet ad or these big whale wallet addresses and just follows them. And then just says, okay, this one looks like he's done some pretty good trades. I'm going to follow them again. Gives you some information, goes from there. Follow him on YouTube. He just got his uh, X account taken down. So I'm trying to help him get him back into uh, his X account a little bit back as he puts it back up. So hopefully get some more followers because uh, he's a smart kid. And lastly, if you are at Consensus in Austin, May 29th to 31st, I will be there. Uh, I've got to be there to meet some VCs, not my favorite thing to do, but it's because of this project I'm involved in and, uh, I will be there to hopefully meet some of you. So, uh, find out, I'll do all the posts on X and that is it for today. So look, it went a little bit long, but a lot of interesting information that's going on right now, but that's it for today. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Let me talk about it's time sensitive.